Hello, I'm Charlie Plum, and I'm an employment lawyer with McAfee and Taft. And with me are Alyssa Lankford and Isaac Treadaway, uh, two of my law partners who are also employment lawyers. Uh, and we're here today to talk about a decision by the U.S. Supreme Court this summer, the, the Groff decision. Uh, and it's significant because it really changes the whole playing field on what employers are going to need to do and, and how they should handle requests by employees for some sort of change or some sort of accommodation uh, in their work or their work assignments based upon that employee's religious beliefs or religious practices. And so really what we want to do today is discuss uh, what you should consider and how you should address probably an increasing number of requests you're going to get from your employees uh, about religion, about changes they may want to want, what they may want in their job as a result of their beliefs or practices. So uh, with that, Alyssa, let's start and let's give our employers kind of an overview of what Title VII requires of employers when it comes to uh, religious beliefs or requests for accommodation. Definitely. So Title VII is a federal law that prohibits discrimination in employment based on a variety of protected classes or characteristics, including religion. So under Title VII, employers cannot discriminate against employees based on their religion um, with respect to the terms and conditions of their employment. Um, that can include hiring decisions, firing decisions, and things along those lines. Title VII also requires employers to give reasonable accommodation to employees based on their religion, where doing so does not cause an undue hardship for the employer. Um, and so when we're talking about religious accommodations, I think the easiest way to contextualize that is just to provide a few examples. Well, can tell us some of the examples employers have come to you and ask, hey, I've got this request by an employee. Should I consider it? Give us some of your examples. Right. So, you know, one example of a religious accommodation could be if you have an employee that because of their religion needs to wear a specific maybe head covering or type of dress and permitting that employee to um, wear those those garments. Another potential um, accommodation that we see quite often is requests from employees regarding not working on the Sabbath. So whether that's Sunday or another day of the week, dependent upon the employee's religion or religious beliefs. And then, you know, another one that we've seen and is relatively common is employers working with employees to provide break periods or break time for employees to pray if their religion requires or encourages them to pray a certain number of times a day um, or at certain times of the day. So these are just examples. Um, they're, they're by no means exhaustive and just kind of help give a better idea of what we're talking about when we say a religious accommodation. So Isaac is going to bring us up to speed with this recent Groff decision by the Supreme Court. Before he does that, uh, tell us what sort of standards or guidelines employers before this decision were supposed to apply when an employee said, hey, I need the following change. I need the following accommodation because of what I believe in. Right. So as I mentioned just a moment ago, employers are required under Title VII to provide a reasonable accommodation to an employee based on their religious belief where doing so does not cause an undue hardship for the employer. So previously, courts, when interpreting this undue hardship language, had provided a standard that was basically if, if the employer would incur a de minimis cost because of providing that accommodation to the employee, they had the ability to deny that request for accommodation. De minimis, meaning just even a small ex expense would justify an employer saying, I can't do that. Right. It was a very minimal standard um, and therefore very employer friendly. Um, and so courts in in applying this standard had, you know, looked at things such as, you know, a, a fiscal cost to providing that accommodation and justifying an undue hardship defense, or maybe looking at whether applying or providing a, an accommodation would cause a safety risk or a safety issue at work or whether there would be animosity or bur a burden placed on other employees if the employer provided this specific employee that religious accommodation. So this de minimis standard was pretty minimal. Um, and again, employer friendly in the sense that it gave employers pretty wide latitude on what um, they they could grant or deny with respect to religious accommodations. OK, so uh, Isaac, that was the that was kind of what employers were dealing with until this Supreme Court decision, Groff. Tell us a little bit about 
what that case involved and its significance in terms of changing the rules or the standard employers should apply going forward. Yes, in the Groff decision, the Supreme Court ultimately redefined the standard that Alyssa just discussed as it applies to Title VII religious accommodation requests. The case specifically involved a a U.S. postal worker who worked for the USPS that claimed to be an evangelical Christian and didn't want to work on Sundays. This usually isn't an issue for the USPS as they don't deliver on Sundays, but they entered into a contract with Amazon requiring them to make certain deliveries on Sundays. Um, At first, the accommodation was to send the employee to a different location that didn't have a contract, but eventually they got a contract with Amazon too. And so they started requiring him to work on Sundays as they claimed they couldn't accommodate his accommodation. Eventually, he just didn't show up to work, got write-ups, and resigned before they terminated him. And the case was appealed all the way to the Supreme Court, where lower courts were applying the de minimis standard, but the Supreme Court in a unanimous decision decided that that wasn't the right definition of undue hardship under how, Title VII. How, how did they change that from the, the de minimis, the lower standard, Alyssa told us about what's new with Groff. Yes, and so it must be, a, the, the accommodation must be provided unless it has a substantial impact on the cost of the business. And so it's a very ambiguous definition or standard, but the court does give you some guidance on what it thinks, uh, fa- what factors it thinks that employers should consider. Is it just cost or what other factors are employers supposed to consider when someone asks for some sort of change or accommodation based on their religious beliefs or practices? Yeah, the court instructs lower courts to look at the nature of the business, the size of the business, and the operational cost of the business. The Supreme Court also noted that most of the EEOC guidance on the issue is still going to be applicable, but did state that not all of it was going to remain the same. And then the Supreme Court also let employers know that the impact on other employees, co-workers, by accommodating the religious accommodation um, would only be considered uh, under the analysis if it actually affected the conduct or operation of the business. So animosity or disgruntled employees um, because they have to help the other employer won't be counted. Okay, okay. So I think one of the, one of the things you as employers need to anticipate in the future the Groff decision and the coverage we're seeing about uh, the recent Groff decision, uh, you should anticipate more and more requests by employees for some sort of change or for some sort of accommodation to their work or their uh, assignments or responsibilities based upon religious beliefs or religious practices. We're already seeing We're getting more and more questions, more and more challenges from employees, and you need to expect that as well. Uh, You know, I I think besides that, uh, you mentioned, uh, Isaac, that we've got some existing guidances or guidelines that the EEOC has provided to employers. Uh, How are we supposed to use those going forward, and and what are we going to get from the EEOC in the future now that we have this new Groff decision? I think those, the guidance is still going to be helpful for employers, but you can't rely on them exclusively. Um, until we get new guidance from the EEOC, um, employers need to be careful and, and engage in a detailed analysis of accommodation requests. We should be getting uh, guidance from the EEOC soon, but we don't know for sure when it will come out. Al- Alyssa, give, give our, our listeners and our viewers some idea of, of how you would suggest or recommend to them they address an employee's request for some sort of change or accommodation based on their religion. And one thing I wanted to ask, uh, the idea of religion, let's, let's, let's hit that. How broad is, re- is religion or faith, uh, how broad is that definition under Title VII? It's, it's very broad. So, you know, when we traditionally think religion, I think sometimes individuals will think only of kind of the major religions, Christianity. Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, um, and those definitely are are count as um, religion under Title VII. Okay. But religion is defined more broadly to include, you know, less known religions, less maybe less followed religion or spiritual types of beliefs, whether that's theistic or non-theistic types of beliefs. Courts have generally um, favored upholding an individual's alleged or claimed religious beliefs as counting as religion under Title VII and have deferred um, to the employee or to the individual claiming that those are their religious beliefs. Um, so it's a, it's a broad definition of 
what is a faith, what is a religion, it has to be sincerely held. Absolutely, okay. yes. So, t- so walk us through what sort of uh, recommendations you would make on how an employer should address. I've, co- I've come to you and said, hey, Alyssa, I, I, I need the following modification or accommodation based on my religious beliefs or religious practices. How, how would you how would you advise employers to handle those? Right. So I think what we're going to need to do, especially after the Groff um, decision, is employers are going to need to engage in a very fact intensive inquiry when working with employees who have requested accommodations for their religion or religious beliefs. So this is an interactive process that's akin to what we um talk about with respect to the ADA, with the Americans with Disabilities Act. And I do want to make one point clear. The the process that employers should engage in with respect to determining whether or not they can grant a religious accommodation is similar to the ADA. But the standard that's applied to whether providing a religious accommodation causes the employer an undue hardship is different under Title VII for religious accommodations than it is under the ADA. Okay, so when when you throw around this term interactive process, what does that mean to our employers? What is an interactive process? Right, it's engaging with the employee to learn more about the accommodation that they're requesting, taking the facts and circumstances of that specific religious accommodation request, and then determining whether based on the the operations of that business, of that employer's business, um, the costs and all of the the overarching factors that have been set forth by the Supreme Court and Groth, whether or not the employer can grant that reasonable accommodation um, without triggering the undue hardship test. Very fact, very fact intensive, Absolutely. case by case, and a lot of communication. Definitely. Isaac, any other tips you would uh, give to our employers? This is this is a, a kind of a new world for everybody. Any other ideas on this accommodation consideration or process? Sure. One thing to keep in mind, as Alyssa said, that the process is similar to the ADA, although the standard is different. But like the ADA, you don't the employers don't have to just accept outright the accommodation offered by the employee. They can consider other accommodations that might be better for their business. So. The Groff decision dealt with uh, the Sabbath. So taking that example, um, if an employee requests to not work on the Sabbath, the employer can uh, request that they seek to trade shifts first. Um, They can seek to uh, volunteer PTO time from other employees to allow them to take off. And in in the right circumstances like Groff, you can ask them to transfer another location. That requires a detailed analysis to know if it's okay. But there other are other options for employers. So as I as an employer, I don't have to necessarily accept your request for accommodation. I could look for something else that would still be respectful of your religious practices or beliefs, but fit better with my operations. That's correct. The idea is not to just accept the accommodation outright, but to allow them to practice their religion effectively. What what are other uh, tips? Uh, what about uh, you're unsure as an employer on on an accommodation. Maybe you don't know whether a particular accommodation is is going to work or not. What would you suggest to employers under that circumstance? Right. It, and case law in the EOC is clear that just because you implement an accommodation doesn't mean you always have to stick with it. You can test out an accommodation to see if it truly causes an undue hardship. And in fact, if it does, it could be helpful later on proving that it was uh, that the accommodation required an undue hardship. Okay, so one thing we need to keep in mind when dealing with this accommodation, and it's true with disability uh, accommodations also, if you're uncertain, there's nothing wrong with doing an accommodation on a trial basis. And as Isaac points out, if it's unsuccessful, that kind of strengthens your hand and say, I'm sorry, this this accommodation request, whether it's religious or disability, tips the scale and becomes an undue hardship. And one thing I hope everybody uh, who's participating, listening, uh, realizes is this is really, this is a new and significant change. Uh, unfortunately, the Groff decision, the Supreme Court decision that Isaac talked about this summer uh, does not at this point give us a ton of guidance. Uh, we're going to be waiting for the EEOC to issue some new guidelines, again, that are going to give us some more direction and some more rules to take into account or follow. But this is going to be a developing area of the law. We're going to be here at McAfee and Taft following those developments, whether it's a new EEOC guidance or cases that are decided as we as we walk down this road. And we're going to keep you posted on those de- developments so you can continue to be in front of that and make the right decisions in running your business. Thank you so much for your time.